You're listening to a Burnt Toast production. A sunrise like a tea stain, and most of the city miss it. Soon, office workers will crawl out of bed and into suits and polish shoes. Buses will arrive late and trains will be so full that commuters will tumble backwards from doors onto other commuters waiting on the platform. A few thousand passengers will reach their destinations and realise they've forgotten their Oyster cards. Minicabs booked to take lovers to airports will not arrive. Half a million people will sleep through breakfast, having forgotten to set their alarms. Tens of thousands of slices of toast will be burned. Someone will wait crying for a dead dog. Someone else for a lost lover. Someone will leave his favourite hat on a bus seat. Four hundred cars will crash and eight people will be knocked from their push bikes. He sees all of this and more. He sees that just before lunchtime, three men will come to kill him. But that won't matter, because by then, he will no longer exist. The Terrible Business of Salmon and Dusk, written and read by Mike Bartlett. Book One, How to Disappear Completely. Episode One. Six months later, here is Theodora Jones, dressed as a waitress and leaving the Camden Cafe for the final time. Her chin is up and her shoulders are back. She has just been fired and it has cheered her up no end. There, just across the road, are two invisible men. Five minutes ago they watched her stand on the threshold of the Camden Cafe, studying her sneakers and wishing she were anywhere else. They have waited for her boss to break his news and none of it has surprised them. Nothing surprises them. The older of the two is tall, but otherwise unremarkable. The younger is not quite as tall, but no more interesting. Both have hair of an indistinct brown that is neither fashionable nor unfashionable. Likewise, their suits are neither modern nor outdated. They are the sort of suits people think of when they imagine men in suits. For that matter, these are the sort of men people think of when they imagine men. Everything about them meets, but never exceeds, expectations. Theo does not notice these men. Nobody does. That is the point of these men. But they see her. They see everything. She'd been smiling coming in, flicking friendly V's at the barista. Late, of course. She was forever late, arriving everywhere sweaty in yesterday's shirt and the same leather jacket. But Tex had been waiting behind the coffee machine, lurking like tomorrow's bad weather, and summoning her with a nod. He hadn't waited for her to follow. So there she was, halfway employed and halfway not, studying her feet like she'd never seen them before. Tex looked up, saw her waiting, and gestured for her to shut the door behind her. I think you know what this is about, he said as she sat down. Theo pressed the black toe of her shoe to the floor and steadied her chair. Is it a promotion? Tex's elbows dug down on scattered piles of unpaid invoices. He was a squat man, too wide for his narrow office. Sweat lakes bloomed under his armpits, and greying scurf clung to a greased head. A groan escaped him, and he glanced around as if wondering where it went. He looked at Theo, swerving left to right in her chair, with more pity than she would have wished, taking in her black tights, creased with care to disguise a ladder, her white shirt, more or less ironed, her black skirt, twelve degrees askew, a handful of product in her hair, disguising chaos as styling, restless, spidery limbs, but a straight, regal neck. You could try explaining yourself. He says it was an unprovoked attack. It wasn't unprovoked. So explain it to me. Tex stared. He stared a lot, sometimes at her face. His lectures on timekeeping were more often given to nipple than to eyeline, but Theo reasoned hers could do with the attention. If waitressing was the best job her boobs could manage, she would take it over cleaning toilets. Since arriving in London... Theo found there was a certain degree of accounting involved in discerning the tone of a dead-end job. Poor house wages and a perving boss could be balanced against reasonable opening hours and ease of labour. She tried to balance most of life in such a manner, boyfriends, employment, bus routes and train lines, but was a hopeless accountant. As with her timekeeping, despite her best efforts, Theo was endlessly living in the red. The plate slipped, she said. Well, that's not what this says. He taps at the letter, freshly filleted from its envelope. A glance at the letterhead, the typed body, 
suggests something serious and expensive. He's threatening to sue the restaurant for malicious damage. It wasn't malicious, it was an accident. Big Theo doesn't believe a word she is saying, and Tex can't help but notice. It had been after the lunch rush, the kitchen winding down, afternoon punters settling in with the papers, the occasional book, sipping coffees with competitive complacency. Two middle-aged Americans brought a loud conversation in through the doors and sat down in Theo's half of the cafe. Expensive, matching outfits, his white hair gleaming, hers platinum and coiffured, talking like they were being paid for it. Theo left them alone for a few minutes, making gestures at cleaning the counter. He clicked his fingers for service. She came over with her notebook, but they weren't ready to order. The wife changed her mind thrice, began to wonder if it was too late for brunch. Theo stood there with her pen, tuning out from the table, tuning into others. This was her favourite occupation, drawing windows into the lives of the customers, extrapolating careers and loves and large houses by the park, envying the choices and decisions that had built these lives for them, the possibilities seized. At twenty-two, she had a sense that there were already doors to which she would never be given keys, and other doors that, once opened, would forever close behind her. Are you actually a waitress, or is that get up for Halloween? The man was looking up with a smirk and a fat finger glued to his menu. February was the wrong month for the joke, but that wasn't his problem. Sorry, Theo said again, taking their order with more fluster than was desirable. Something about his steady smirk, their smug and casual wealth, the labelled clothes, the gold watches, the loudness of their voices, offended her in ways she didn't fully understand. There was a judgement implicit in their success. There was more to what happened next. Mitigating circumstances and a mid-Atlantic misunderstanding about a spaghetti cabanara, the man, puffed up on his own wit, had attempted to humiliate her in front of a lunchtime crowd, tourists and regulars alike, all of which ended with Theo emptying the aforementioned cabanara over her customer's smug head. This warm squid of a meal slid from its tipped plate, squirting cream as its panicked tentacles clutched at his tidy hair, his slattered eyes, the brownish bulb of his nose. It slithered and squirmed down his shirt front to gather, quivering in the lap of his chinos. Nobody was more surprised by this than Theo herself. She wasn't aware of making any decision, watching her hands move as if directed by someone else, as if this was always going to happen. She was only a witness. Putting the legal letter down, Tex pinched the bridge of his nose and held his eyes closed. You know I have to fire you. Do you, though, or do you just feel like you should? Tex frowned, obliged to miss any joke. It's in the letter. You go or I get screwed over in court. You know what Americans are like. Three lawyers to every white man. I could take the day off. Come back next week. Slouching back in his chair, Tex rubbed both hands through what was left of his hair. He looked at her in one of his three different ways she couldn't stand. Two of them were textbook sleazy, but this third look was the worst. This was a look that saw her more clearly than she could have hoped. It was the look he gave her the first time she tried to use the coffee machine she had promised in her interview that she knew inside out. The truth was, she had never in her life made a coffee more complicated than an Escafé. Tex had seen the truth. How about you tell me something? Tell me why you did it. No, how about I tell you? Because I think you know. You don't want this job. You never did. Theo managed a fair impression of surprise. Almost impressed herself. Why do you say that? Tex leant forward again, put up his left hand, and started counting fingers. One. You're always late. Every single shift. I'm new to London. I'm still optimistic about trains. Two. You won't memorise table numbers. Are they the same every day? Three. You lied about being able to make coffee. It honestly didn't look that hard. There were fingers left. This worried Theo, but Tex folded them away. I like you, Theo. That's the only reason I keep paying you. But ask yourself, do you really want this job? The answer was so obvious, Theo nearly said it aloud. The problem, she realised, was that she had no idea what sort of job she might want. Her career, such as it wasn't, was defined by negatives. Jobs too boring, too mindless, too absorbing, too predictable. Waitressing 
she discovered over the course of the last six weeks, met each of these criteria. Knowing that didn't help, Tex was about to fire her. Fired up with hurt pride, Thea wondered if it was too late to resign. Instead, she heard herself say, What if I write an apology? I could buy a card. Chocolates. I I mean, I'd need an advance on next week. She heard herself fighting for a job she couldn't stand. Maybe Tex heard it too. I'll pay out for next week, Tex said, and throw in something for tomorrow. If you need a reference... Faced with the inevitable, Theo stood. Anything but a surrender. I don't need one. I'll be fine. Stepping out now onto Campton High Street, Theo feels a dizzying lightness. Doors are opening. She is no longer a waitress. Was never meant to be a waitress. Fate is calling her to something better. That's why she's here, isn't it? Any humiliation is fast receding into the past where it might as well have happened to somebody else. There is music on her iPod. There are eight cigarettes left in the packet. The tourist crowds that jostle her promise a sense of anonymity, that she could melt into the throng and be anyone else. She can start again. Her phone is in her hand, halfway to calling Josh, but her thumb hesitates. She realises she isn't ready for his disappointment, or his pity. That surprises her. Theo! Her name is called three times before she turns. This is Camden. Someone is always shouting something. Theo Jones! A boy she doesn't know is standing behind her. He's about her age, probably Pakistani, but there isn't time to ask. His feet are in two-toned brogues, his socks are white, his trousers are pressed straight, his top button is fastened, and his dark hair is swept down beneath a narrow trilby. The bruise around his right eye looks fresh. I'm here to help, he says. Sorry, help with what? Your boyfriend. For a discomforting moment, she wonders if this boy has read her mind. Josh? How many boyfriends you got? What do you mean help? The boy grimaces, each new question and affront. He stands at an angle, stiff with impatience, as if already half gone. I mean help find him. Find him? Why, what's happened to him? The grimace sets into a scowl. You don't know. Should I? He pulls up the sleeve of his crombie and checks his watch. Unsatisfied with this, he pulls up the other sleeve and checks the watch there. The left wrist boasts a fake Rolex, the right a cheap digital. Neither pleases him. Above the digital, a paisley handkerchief is tied like a bandage or a reminder. Muttering someone's name under his breath, the boy turns and strides away. Hang on, Theo says. Have we met? She chases him, half-hearted, embarrassed by her effort, while he moves fast and easily through the midweek crowd. By the time they reach the throng of the tube station, he's vanished. Half-baked theories assemble and dismantle themselves. She calls Josh, not expecting him to answer. When he does, she almost feels disappointed. A little fissure of possible drama seals, a detour closes, and life resumes. She worries sometimes about this hunger for incident, that she wills on disaster as a means of staving off boredom. Or is it simply so things are no longer her fault? Just checking you're not dead, she says. I didn't get enough sleep to die in it. The droll nature of this remark, a joke she isn't invited to share, bothers her. When did he become droll? Is this important? I guess not. Pub tonight? It's your liver. Gotta go. She bristles at the importance in his voice. He has somewhere to be. Theo only has time. The two invisible men watch Theo fumble her way into Camden Town Tube. The younger thumbs a silver cigarette lighter. The flame ignites. He snaps the lid closed to extinguish it. He snaps the lid open. He thumbs the flint wheel again. She doesn't look promising, Crow. His superior ignored him. Do you know what day it is, Woosley? Feels like a Thursday. It isn't Thursday. Could be. What is a Thursday, anyway? Who says this is one? He snaps the lighter closed, open, alight, extinguished. Crow knows enough about philosophy to know when he doesn't like it. In short, whenever his squire attempts it. We say it isn't, Woosley. Dico non est, ergo non est. QED in it. Closed, open, alight, extinguished. Crow sighs. Define promising. What she isn't. 
Weasley stares at the lighter, repeats his routine. It's hypnotic. Every time, he repeats his movements with precision. The same thing every time, and every time the sparks fly from the flint in different constellations. The flame burns a brighter orange or deeper violet. It flickers and bends in shapes no flame has ever held before. There's no planning for it, no predicting it. It amazes and terrifies him. Chaos, he says. Precisely, Crow says. Weasley stops staring at his lighter and stares instead at his master, wondering what he is agreeing with. He scowls with suspicion. Have we had this conversation before? It's possible. Anything is possible. Henceforth, we are off the books. Do you know what day it is, Woosley? We have had this conversation before. I said Thursday. It isn't Thursday. Only because you said it wasn't, in Latin. I'll tell you what day it is, Woosley. Today is the first day of the end of the world. Oh, yeah, Woosley says, snapping his zippo open again. I knew that already. <laughs> You've been listening to The Terrible Business of Salmon and Dusk. Book One, How to Disappear Completely, written and read by Mike Bartlett. You've been listening to a Burnt Toast production.